Hello, we are live. Welcome to FMA discussion number 10. Just waiting for Frank. Come on with Phil. In the meantime, what can I talk about? Oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. Let's get a bring. Okay, here we go. Hey, yo, Dean. How are you? Hey, good, good, good. So, what, uh, everything work out all right as far as this goes? Yeah, it looks good. I can see. Perfect. Yeah, I can see you both. Uh, perfect. Good. Well, I want to yeah. welcome both to uh, this FMA discussion. I appreciate, uh, Phil, you uh, doing some of the legwork. <laughs> well, I had to connect yeah. the right guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Frank, it's uh, nice to meet you from afar, and thank you for coming on and joining us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Thank oh, my God. No pleasure. So you guys can hear and see me perfect? I can hear you and see you perfect. Yep. All right. We're good to go, well, then. All right. Hit by you time, so it's actually safer for me. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 All right. Well, I'm not going to jump right into it. Um, Usually, I like to do before we get into the topic at hand, Mar Nice and all that. I usually like to always start with background. So, pre, you know, Master Priestess and and your journey with Mar Nice, what did um, what was or is your background? Um, yeah. So I kind of you know, as a kid, but then I got more into baseball and I pursued that for quite a while. And then when I got out of baseball, I found I really missed something, some type of activity. So I got bigger into martial arts at that point, but it was really more like informal sparring. I do a lot of sparring. That was my big thing I like to fight. Um, at one point I finally ended up joining a school and I got into Kempo. So Kempo is really my base art. Um, I did that for about two years. And then one day my teacher came driving up on his motorcycle and I saw these like handles in his backpack and I thought they were tennis rackets. So I said, oh, I didn't realize you played tennis. And he goes, I don't play tennis, these are sticks. So we pulled out the sticks and honestly, I wasn't really impressed. I looked at them, they seemed kind of boring to me. But he thought so much of them that I said, you know, there must be something to it. So I took a few lessons. I don't mean to, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off because I definitely want to get in this part. So how, how old were you then when he, uh, when you first experienced him pulling the sticks out? What was your age then? Um, early 20s. Early 20s. So like circa what year? Um... Late 80s? Late 80s. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, all right. So, and this, so at this point, though, you don't have your own school. You're just still a student. I'm what a have student. you? I'm a student. And I'm doing, okay. Kempo. I'm doing Kempo. I'm maybe about green belt level in Kempo. Yeah. And then after a few lessons, all of a sudden it just really clicked with me. I liked the handwork and the stick work. And um, then he told me about Remy Priestess, who I'd never heard of. And hmm. we decided to go to a camp in Holyoke. Richard Roy hosted a camp at Holyoke. And so um, what was your teacher's, I'm just curious, what was your teacher's name? Eric Alexander. Okay, so he was the one, all right, I'm just, I'm just trying to get some historical perspective here as far as modern Nice in Connecticut. So this is circa late 80s, am I correct? Yeah, late 80s. So he was, is it fair to say he was seeing at this uh, throughout the time, Master Priestess? Um, actually, Professor Priestess came around before the late, later 80s. Um, the first time I saw anything on Modern Artists was in a Black Belt magazine, and they were selling this book, which is uh, huh. 75. This is Remy Priestess. is one of Priestess' first books. Um, it's actually signed by him. And um, I saw an ad in Black Belt magazine, and so I bought the book. And I was trying to follow the book. And one day, uh, you know, back then in the, the uh, early 80s, it was a lot of seminar circuit. Yeah, so yeah. I saw um, something about Professor Price that's going to Middletown Kenpo Karate, run by uh, a teacher named Lee Lowry at the time. So Middletown wasn't far from me. And I went and um, met Professor Price. And that was, that was actually before he started. Uh, the person he's talking about, Eric Alexander, is somebody that I worked with a little bit before he, he got into it. But um, so, yeah, it started with started that early in the early 80s. And, um, wow. Then. 
I didn't, well, I, I tell you, I didn't have, you know, I knew they came in, but uh, I didn't have any idea, um, you know, like it was that early. So, so did he basically at some point, like his first in Connecticut, early 80s, mid 80s? Early 80s. Early 80s. And this, 20, 21 or 22 when, when I, no, I was married. So I had to be, I had to be about, no, I, was, I wasn't married. I don't know. It was a long time ago. I'm old now. <laughs> um, but um, it, was, it was in the early to mid 80s. Yeah, definitely. And um, so we're, okay. Huh. What, um, I'm just sorry, I'm just, I'm not meaning to ignore you guys. Somebody asked, they're not seeing Frank, and I'm good. I'm trying to direct them to my page. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, so I, I gotta be honest with you, that's it. That's very interesting because I, I knew he came to Connecticut, it was sometime in the 80s. I, I had no idea, however, it was the early 80s. Um, and it was so was the first guy you're saying Lee Lowry? Lee Lowry, yeah. You remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I tried to lose already a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And so, uh, wow. Um, how do you, um, because I, I, I want to get back on topic with you, of course. Um, but I, again, I find that interesting because this is why I love doing this stuff because you find out things that, like, if I didn't talk to you guys, I would have had no idea about that. That he actually was around, mm -hmm. you know, around that time. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. So getting back to you, Frank, um, when you, um, Okay, so I understand you're in your 20s, circa 1988, you're green bell. He's, he's starting to basically, is at this point, is he making it, introducing it in the school as a separate class, or is he making it part of the curriculum? We had like a separate club, but mostly I was learning in private lessons. Um, at that point, there weren't a lot of people really in the school doing it. Um, so I was taking a private lesson with Eric Alexander and that's how I met Phil was Eric had uh, Phil come in and teach a few classes. So Phil was a mainstay. Yeah. So Phil, you're holding back on I, us. I taught a little bit. I didn't, you know, this, this guy here went all the way. Oh, I have... the, about, the great thing about professor learning with professor Price, after the thing about Barnes coming, uh, around in the eighties, it really was an introduction to what was out there, you know? Okay. He, he, I think Professor Preces really introduced modern artists to Connecticut. I think. I mean, if anybody out there, you know, knows different, that that'd be great. But. Yeah, that's my perception. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. No, that's um, fantastic. I'm just who's Joe Muscatello? He's trying to. Find, <laughs> I have to. I have to message him again. He's um yeah he's a, a teacher here at Cromwell Martin and, All right. I'm sorry. I'm just going to message him just to let him know that. He's got to go to my wall here. Um, yeah, he's my uh, my top modern knee student. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, hopefully, he's going to uh, do that. Uh, Tim, thank you. Uh, Tim Gillette, nice comment. Said Frank's the best. Um, Thanks, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, okay, so you're okay again. So we're kind of just to get some uh, chronological perspective here. Phil, hold, Phil's been holding out on us. <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> so we've concluded that. But um, so this is okay. So you're green belt. You're doing this. Um, it's kind of a separate club and all that. So let's. I, I guess let's take off from there. So we went to our first camp. Holyoke and my whole world just opened up for me at that point you know a uh, professor called modernist the art within your art and it sounds like kind of like catchy little you know tag phrase there but it's really true what would happen is you'd have people from all different martial arts styles there at this camp you know anything from you know jiu-jitsu to kempo to taekwondo to tai chi to you know you name it um I remember one group just came from a Wally J camp with joint locking and their fingers were all taped up and bruised. <laughs> they went from camp to camp. Um, so okay. go ahead. Did he, how did he, I guess my question is, um, of all the systems, and again, I'm not saying I'm right in this, just from what, I, what I've heard and all that, of all the FMA systems, how was he able to get kind of into the traditional martial art community? Is that, is that fair? Is that yeah, well, I think, again, this is what Frank said. He, he advertised he, the art within your art. 
So like Wing Lowry in, in at Middletown Kenfo had a Kenfo school. That was his main school. Okay. He was studying art. I don't know how he started with, with artists, but he was definitely studying with, with Professor Prasas before, uh, before that. So he, he brings him in as sort of like a supplement. And Professor Prasas starts showing you the stick work and then adding uh, his empty hand, which was kind of close to, you know, putting it in with the Kenpo. And so people were saying, wow, this is great. I can do my Kenpo or I can do my Taekwondo or whatever, and I can add these techniques to it. So that was Professor Prasas' in, was that mm -hmm. his art would fit into your art. It wasn't a separate thing. And it, it pretty much tweaked a lot of interest um, from different core martial arts schools because they could bring Professor in more okay. techniques and you know go with it. They could either continue or they could just stay with what they had. Yeah, he wouldn't say stop doing what you're doing and do what I'm doing. He'd say keep doing what you're doing but add what I'm doing to it. Okay, okay, okay. So that's okay. So did, generally speaking, though, did most traditional schools make it a separate class, or did they kind of? I would say it would be. I mean, I'm not saying it'd be impossible, but um. Or would he ask you, hey, you know, you can blend this with that? Or did he, was there a direction he kind of, he gave you guys or maybe no, suggested? No. Well, here's the thing. Because he didn't have his own school where everybody could come and learn, you know, at a school, he traveled a lot. Most people have bits and pieces of the art. They have some Sinawalis, maybe a form or two. So they didn't really have enough to have a huge program. A few of us. Oh, had okay. And we actually, a few of us actually learned the whole thing. So we could have a school or a club like that. So, so he kind of sprinkled it all around the world. You know, people have some Shinawali, they have some disarms. Um, but, but not necessarily maybe the full syllabus curriculum per no, se. Lee Lowry did. Yeah, Lee Lowry Middle, did. Middletown Kentball had it. He had yeah. the... Oh, oh he, he, he put enough time in? Okay. Yeah, he had the whole... Lee Lowry had the whole thing. Um, matter of fact, this is... I mean, this is just the syllabus of, of the black belt test back then. I, I was looking at my uh, book, and um, I actually got my black belt in in 1987. So, but this from is from from Yeah, I don't remember. Phil, wow, Phil's definitely been holding on on this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but you know, Dean, you can you can understand. You know, you Filipino martial arts are they're wide, and and so you learn one, you want to go learn another. You know? No, yeah, no, no, and I definitely appreciate that. But I'm just thinking though, like for the time that you're saying, like you, you know, when you say '80s, like. Like, I, in other words, I put it into the context of, like, okay, 93, first UFC changes, has this huge impact on the martial arts world and what have you. But for FMA in Connecticut in the 80s, mm -hmm. you know, you're saying California, you know, different New York City, you know, different conversation. But for Connecticut, that's that's pretty early, you know, I think, anyhow. Yeah, he taught a lot of seminars in New England area. Like, he was in Massachusetts a lot. He was in okay. Connecticut. He was in New York, um, so he really spent a lot of time in New England area. So where's Lee now? Just I mean, I definitely have heard that name, and obviously he was a trendsetter in his own right. Where, like, did he, where's he now? Just out of curiosity. Um, I think he's a DJ. I think he's a very good DJ, and I think he's big into actually um, like ballroom dancing. Well, he's much older than he's older than us, right? But, yeah. yeah. But, but I saw him a couple of years ago, and I had a good talk with him. And uh, he's still he's happy and doing well, and he's very really, really talented guy. So he kind of did this, and then sounds like he sold his school and yeah. went on to different things. Okay, okay. Um, I was Lee just Lee curious because I always heard about him. Lee 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 actually had a self defense program for police, um, and he would teach that in Connecticut and go around to different uh, police um, things. But I know he had that. Okay. Kind of okay. Okay, like again, like I've always, you know, I heard about the guy, but I just, I didn't know if he was still teaching or if he, um, you know, I'm gonna tag Joe on here. I, I don't think he's still finding this. I'm sorry. Um, I've been teaching. Um, <laughs> so, um, just so he can uh, check it out. Um, so if he doesn't see the tag, then. I don't know what else I could do, but okay. Hopefully this will help them. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so all right, so Frank, getting, getting back to like your beginning journey and all that. I, I know we're kind of around the 1988. At what point, I guess, from there, did you? Um, uh, I don't want to jump timeline, but did you get your black belt in Kempo and at the same time, maybe minor niece, or was it kind of in 
in conjunction there, which led you to do your own place? Yeah, so I was already in Kempo for a couple of years, and Kempo is like my base art. Um, so I think I got my black belt in Kempo before I got it in Modern Arnese. Okay. Yeah. And then at one point, eventually, the main teacher I was working with moved out of state, and I thought, what do I do now? You know, um, so I traveled around to two different school, schools and everything, and finally I thought, you know, the thing I want to do is open my own school. And Professor uh, Priestess was right there saying, don't worry, I'll help you, you know. Uh, Oh, fantastic. He was kind of like a very good mentor, not just a teacher. To many people, he's a very good mentor and always very encouraging. Oh, wow. So then, so what, just circle, what year did this occur about? Um, well, I opened up my own school in 1993. So, no, okay. So from, all right. So, 90, so at that point, um, were you then, were you a black belt then in modern East or were you still working towards it? Um, I believe that that's when, about when I got my black belt. Was right around that. Time. Oh, so that was nice. You, you're opening up your school in conjunction. You just received your black belt in that and all that. Okay, okay. So um, is that now when you had your school and all that? Um, well, let me back up a bit. When you first you first met uh, Master Priestess in Massachusetts, was that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Promoted by Richard Roy. Okay, so at that point, were you making sure that you went to the camps and got to see him pretty regularly? And oh, oh yeah, I started traveling all over, going to as many camps as I could. I went to Florida, Georgia, Illinois. You know, oh, so you were hooked. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you were okay. Yeah, I went to Delaware. One day he did a seminar here, and then he was going on a plane to go to Delaware, and I didn't tell him, but I jumped in my car right when he jumped in the plane. And I took off and drove all night. So he got to Delaware, and I got to Delaware. And he said, "Frank, what are you doing here? How did you get here?" And uh, I was oh my like, "Gosh, I was just yeah, man, that I, well, that's that's pretty good. I don't know if I would be uh, yeah. jumping a car to Delaware, yeah, but uh, oh, wow. I didn't have a family. But the most amazing thing is the first time I promoted a seminar with him is he stayed yeah. for three days after the seminar and trained me for three days." And that was the most amazing experience. I learned more in three days than I had in the past two years, I think. Yeah, here you are. You're like person to person for three whole days. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, so after, no. two days, after two days, he said, well, your stick work is very good, but your locks are weak. So we spent the whole third day doing nothing but locks. Oh, that must oh okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, but, but I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> so, Phil. Like uh, now, during around this time frame, are you kind of in the in the picture? You're popping through, or what have you? No, I I, I think during that time frame, I started to get more um, involved in the seminar circuit. I started to go to the Inosanto seminars. I started to um, uh, go to like some of the Monday Muda ones. I followed. I, I went to one Lameco one, and um, I actually have the the certificate signed by. Uh, uh, by Edgar Solite, but um, oh my gosh, good on you! So yeah. I'm gonna guess Tucci's. Um, I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know he was bringing them out, from my understanding, pretty frequently. Yeah. Yeah, so I pretty much stuck with that, and um, but if it wasn't for modern artists and Professor Preissas, you know, that was a springboard. Learned yeah, yeah, you're right. No, no, no. We right. We all have one. You know what yeah. I mean? Like for me, it was. Seen Ron's Kuntal, which led me to go to Sayoc, Atienz. I mean, right, we all have a springboard. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. Uh, I settled in with, uh, really settled in with uh, Ray Galang's group in, in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so what, again, back just, just to my Anissa whole, just so maybe the viewers, even include myself, can get a better understanding. Because um, I'm going to be honest with you, the reason I, I, I wanted to have you both on is, I mean, I, of course, I know about modern East. It doesn't mean I know about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, uh, what? Um, you know, obviously, you know, you meet him. You're you're getting, you know, you you want to pursue all that. Was there anything in particular that really left a lasting impression on you that you wanted to pursue this to black belt, other than maybe seeing a stick flying around? I mean, was there like stuff that really captivated you? There was a number of things. Um, I think one thing is it blended well with any art that I've ever seen. Um, it doesn't matter Kwondo, Tai Chi, whatever, Shur and Ru. Um, it just seemed to blend well with almost any art, and I really like that about it. Also, I felt like it kind of filled a little bit of gaps maybe in my own training. 
you know, like I hadn't done a lot with locking before. And um, he had locking to start with, but then when he worked with Wally J, his locking just got all the, all the better. Oh, I didn't. I, okay, that's new to me. I didn't know those two had a, uh, okay, wow, okay. Well, yeah, back in the day, they're called the big three. It was George Billman, Wally J, and Remy Priestess, and they would travel and do seminars. Oh, it's kind of like Dan Asano, Little Fawn. Okay, okay, okay. The three of them. So he would watch these guys, and he just would get better and better by watching other people. Um, Interesting. I remember I was at a seminar once, and Joe Lewis was there, and Professor Priest was off on the side watching Joe Lewis, and the gears are turning in his head. And then in future seminars, I saw him teaching these different boxing, or something like boxing drills. And you know, I don't know for a fact, but I believe that he got the ideas by watching some of the Joe Lewis handwork. Boxing oh, Joe Lewis is bot. He had to have. Yeah. Right. I watched his boxing. Sure, sure. That makes sense. Always, um, always learning and evolving. You know, I like that about him as well. So he. Just, yeah, evolving. That's you know? no argument here. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, and then okay, when um, as far as that, like, uh, you know, I know you mentioned locking and all that, but like from then again, this is just my understanding. I'm not claiming. You know, yeah. all that. But is it predominantly, it's mostly the concentration is stick work? Okay, so, yeah, so here's the thing. Um, it does have the traditional thing of, like, long weapon, short weapon, or spotty daga. It does have the single stick, and then um, it does have the sinawali. Those are kind of three classical components. But he also added a lot of locking to it. And really, at its core, um, I believe it's actually a bladed art. You know, we would use the stick because it's a lot safer training but really should be able to take everything and translate it to a blade. So really, I okay. think it's a bladed art. I think um, the other thing you have to keep in mind is that Professor Presas developed his system from traditional Filipino martial arts to bring it to the schools um, in the Philippines. He wanted to introduce it as a physical, um, uh, you know, phys ed. And that's why, you know, he, he kind of, made it very structured. You know, he's got stances, like a lot of the criticisms of modern artists is that, well, his stances look like karate stances. Well, in the Philippines, way back then, karate started to become a big thing. And that was getting introduced to the schools. So he wanted to take the traditional Filipino martial arts and make them more accommodating to, um, to everybody. So he, he set up, a, a, you know, a, from A to Z type of system. And he, he does have the bladed art. He does have all that, because I remember him showing some of it when, when I was with Lee Ari a little bit. And it's pretty much what we see in a lot of other systems. Mm -hmm. So it was just his structure was to get it out to everybody, but not make it, um, as one instructor says, make soup. <laughs> um, so, you know, he, he, that's, how he, that's how I saw him doing it. Um, but he was still really efficient. And, and that was one of the attractions. When, when I went to go see him at, uh, at Lowry School and started training, um, it was just a very efficient system. It seemed like a very efficient system. And it wasn't a lot of flash. You know, I mean, he could make it look flashy. He could make yeah. it look flashy. And you could be there the second time and never take a you know, class. Right, right. Um, but it was still, it was, it was an efficient system. And that's what I liked about it. You know, it wasn't any, any crazy high kicks or anything like that. Yeah, he was a physical education teacher, so he was well educated, you know. So he really brought some good education to his curriculum when he designed. I must, I'm sure that must have helped him too, far as like generating the curriculum, making it, you know, how to get it across, and all that. Um, I want to go back though, you because I've heard this also, and I want to touch upon that because yeah, I want to go, you know, obviously to his family and his roots in the Philippines. Um, what can you give me some insider perspective or history as far as like how we evolved the family? I mean, I know there's there was a, a brother, correct? Ernesto. That, yeah. Okay. So was it handed down by his father or what I guess what's the lineage? I guess well, this thing, I'm not, I'm not a historian with this, but my understanding is he originally started with his father and grandfather, and I guess even his uncle. But then at that point, yeah, she started to travel quite a bit at a young age and train with so many other people. I know Balintawak has a, a big influence, you know, on his training. Uh, so he just traveled a lot and started learning from everybody, which is why he calls it modern learnings, you know, because he, he modified it. Oh, okay, 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 okay. And then, um, all right, so basically, grandfather, father, some uncles, and then obviously his, sounds like his experiences of traveling, kind of what made what we're seeing today. So is that yeah. fair? 
Yeah, and even when he kept the web, over the course of time, he kept evolving. You know, the more he evolved, the more the art evolved. Okay, so, okay. So what was popular? I mean, when ground fighting became more popular, some of the seminars started including ground fighting. <laughs> so uh, okay. he would adapt, and it's how he made his living. He would adapt, you know, depending upon what he learned and what he felt was popular at the time. Hmm. Oh, okay, okay. Just, and going back to just what Phil was, was speaking on, um, I want to kind of, because I've heard that before where besides bringing it into traditional schools and all that, um, you I want to touch upon this, you know, I didn't realize because it, it, it makes sense where in the Philippines, presenting as kind of like a PE class, but also you had, you know, because post-World War II, the Japanese were schools, and of course they had a, they had a very organized curriculum, mm -hmm. they had structure, mm -hmm. they had rank, right. and unfortunately, you know, that wasn't really occurring in FMA at that time, with the exception maybe of a few. Um, did uh, Master Priestess, did, is that something he wanted to change? for the outlook on FMA and wanted to bring structure and all that? It, it, was that one of his goals for as far as outsiders to learn, perhaps? Or to make it yeah. easier to learn? Yeah, it's really hard yeah. to figure whose intent really, you know, it's hard for me to speak to that. Um, I do know that, you know, he really, his driving goal is to make our niece like a worldwide martial art. So I think that he was doing kind of whatever it took for him to get to that place. Um, he really believed in our niece. He loved it. That was his life mission, I think. So yeah. I think kind of whatever he path he needed to take to get there, I think that was really his driving force. And in this book, you know, um, I came across it the other day. He even wrote in the book, you know, to uh, keep to um, propagating modern our niece. <laughs> um, so even back, uh -huh. always on his mind, and that's what he wanted. Yeah, to yeah, do. yeah. So that was his end goal, really, is to make this like a worldwide thing. But uh, you make a good you make a point though, Dean. Back then, after World War II, there 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 was a big popularity in karate and judo. And to your point, yeah, it was very yeah. they had they had belt rankings. They had begin Filipino martial arts. It was you had to learn it quickly for the street or whatever it was. And I and I do I do think that that's what Professor Presas had in mind. Mm -hmm. Because if you do notice in, in the uh, a lot of his stances look like karate type stances, and and the structure of this. Um, of the, the syllabus here is very structured. You start from your stances and you have your body shifting, which is yeah. your footwork. Um, and then you have your single stick and your, you know, uh, meet the force, go with the force, but everything was very, very strong. And he had the full belt, he had the full ranking system yeah. too. Well, he, he did an influence in Shotokan though as well. So oh, okay. he, he was ranked in Shotokan. Oh. So I think that happened. Oh, so maybe there was some carryover when he, when he, dis, when he began structuring minor knees maybe some of the influence from there kind of, of helped them. Because I, you know, uh, there was definitely structure in the Japanese systems. I mean, we know that, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. Just um, what I want to also get into is um, just, okay, the ranking. Um, you know, just, you know, for anybody, you know, coming in, like how does the, how does the ranking structure work? And what is it? Well, I mean, when we started, we have various camps, and then there'd be a syllabus with the information, you know, for each level. And then basically everybody would go out into the floor, and you'd have a panel of instructors. Uh, usually the instructor of the student would kind of give an idea of here's what we think that, you know, that they're going for. And then the, the instructors would decide upon what rank they felt they earned. You know, that's okay. what we back in the day when I did That's how, how they did it. So, but does it basically go white through well, yeah. black? Um, level one is white belt. Level two is yellow. And, and okay. that still stands today. This is very old. Um, levels three and four is blue. And then he would have uh, a blue belt with a white stripe, which denotes level four. So I guess if you got, you got your blue belt, you're on level three. And then if you got the level four, you got a white stripe. Um, green belt is level five. Brown is level seven, and level nine is black belt. And, level nine, okay. And uh, on this here, what I'm looking at, um, this would, could all be done within 12 months of training's curriculum. So, all right, so was there... So you weren't his curriculum, but you didn't, you weren't, 
you weren't expert at it. You were learning the curriculum. Now you had to train that curriculum. Just, okay. So generally speaking, somebody, you know, whatever prior discipline they came from, were there, was there generally time gaps between, you know, like each bell or is it, or was there more, was it more predicated on the ability and it, no, it's like sometimes in the beginning belts, you know, if they're maybe they they haven't mastered it, but they have a pretty good idea of it. But because it's lower belts, you know, you, you'll you'll graduate them, and then obviously they're held more accountable in the higher belts. And I'm just curious. I mean, and I'm nowhere suggesting this was his format. I'm I'm just kind of curious. How do you look at like students or or grade them per se? Yeah. Uh, the last where there was it went to um. I went yellow, blue, high blue, green, high green, four levels of brown, and then black. Um, sometimes there's also probationary black that I've seen happen as well. Um, as far as trying to keep an eye on everything, a lot of the times that would be up to the uh, teacher of the student back at their own school. You know, okay, okay, okay. And then bring them to a camp and then say, hey, here, here's the level I think they should go for. You know, and then they'd watch him and see what level they felt they earned. Okay, so the, the teacher would bring his students, present them yeah. to Master Priestess, and then he, you know, for our evaluation, and it sounds like at the same time, Master Priestess also trusted his instructors. Right. And try to, okay, okay. What about now for all black belts or graduate, you know, where you're able, uh, well, let me, before I jump conclusion, at black belt, at that point, can you teach or is it based on individual basis? Uh, my experience is that he encouraged almost everybody to teach. You know, even if you just kind of started to learn, he'd say, I want you to go back and teach it now. And I think he did that for a couple of reasons. One is he felt it helped you to learn your material by going back and teaching and remembering it. Because I remember oh, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. all the material is just crazy, you know. And, but the other thing is it helped to spread modern art east. You know, you'd go back now and teach everything that you learned. Mm -hmm. So my experience with him is that he'd encourage you to teach pretty early on. Okay, so really, so, I mean, right, but, okay, so what about maybe in the context of, like, where you are actually running a program that's known, you know, obviously, today we got social media, so it's pretty, but I know we're talking, like, late 80s in your case and all that, uh, but if you were actually to run a school or make it a separate class, was he looking, at, would he want you to be black belt then, or if he knew you had a pretty good grasp of things, he would let you go and kind of fly with it. I think it's kind of a case basis. You no, know, like he would. Yeah, that makes sense. He would talk to each person and get a feel for where they're at, and I think it was kind of case by case. Like he actually visited my school went a couple of times. I couldn't believe it. I saw him at a seminar in Massachusetts, and he goes, "Frank, what are you doing tomorrow?" I said, "Well, I'll be in my school." He goes, "Well, what time will you be there?" And I said, "Oh, six o'clock. I will see you there." And I'm like, "Yeah, right." And I forgot about it. And the next day, oh. he, he comes walking through the door. I couldn't believe it. So he watched what I was doing. He watched their classes, you know, and then he said bullseye, you know. And so I think it was kind of case by case, you know, as he got to know you. Okay, okay. So, all right, okay. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, Mast, uh, Rene, I don't want to do abomination on his last name. Um, <laughs> Rene starts with a T. He's the one that created the banner that I've been using for the discussion. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> what was interesting is, which I didn't know, he put it on uh, the Filipino martial arts forum uh, where, where I belong to. And he was saying that my niece is the largest and fastest growing uh, FMA organization. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, you know, I knew it was up there, but I, I had no idea it was, you know, the number one. Um, so obviously, besides the Western world, it sounds like it's pretty big over in the motherland. Is that is that true? Is that? Um, I think so. You know, I can't really have any way to measure it, you know, so I really don't know. Yeah. But yeah. the feeling I get just from the posts on Facebook and people I talk to, the feeling I get is, yeah, there is a lot over there going on. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering. They've got a lot, of, a lot of people that are obviously promoting it and what have you, and and all that, which is kind of so. Whatever they're doing, they got to be doing something right, far as you know, the promotional aspect of it. You know, because um, one of the things with some of these other systems, 
that's kind of uh, lagging, <laughs> you know, um, you know, for one reason or another, you know. Um, but uh, I definitely got a few more questions here. But is there before we get? I, I know we we touched on like the curriculum and all that. The locking, I you know, I definitely heard there's locking and all that. Where um, what can you can you tell us and the folks watching regarding the locking aspect of modern earnings? Um, when he first started teaching the U.S., I thought that he did have locking. You know, a lot of was the basic locks like a center lock, you know, or a finger lock. Um, when he started traveling, working more with Wally J, I noticed he expanded on quite a bit, and he would do like a flow drill, which is what he taught me. And, and, and I do a lot of my seminars now. People really like it. It's going from lock to lock to lock. And it's teaching you just to say you go to put a lock on. It doesn't quite work. Well, how can you go flowing to the next lock? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so he really did add that into intertwine it, you know, throughout his system, a lot of the locking. So perhaps maybe it wasn't sophisticated in the beginning, but as it evolved and he got exposure to other people, it kind of manifested and kind of grew. It definitely grew it was a two-way action stuff like the Wally J did. Oh, okay. right, right. And you mentioned that he had definitely had uh, influence on that. Okay. Um, what are just, you know, again, for the people watching, including myself, um, what are, you know, obviously besides, you know, toilets making access and all that, but what are some of the drills that, you know, a beginner, um, when they first join, like, what, what's some of the content of the curriculum that they would, again, and also from the premise, after I get your contact information and all that, if somebody had an interest to pursue this and with you and all that, like what, would, what are some of the drills that a beginning student would, would, uh, would see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have DVDs that go through every level because I wanted to address that exact thing because I'd go to all these seminars and you might learn Sinawalis at one seminar and then do forms in another seminar. So I thought, how can I come back now and teach this to all of my students? So I put together a curriculum step by step, and I put it all in DVD. Um, oh, good on you. The drills I first learned is you start with the 12 angles of attack. Mm -hmm. You learn basic okay. arms. You learn some basic Sinawalis. Uh, and you start with your forms. And you start to learn the forms in order. You know, and it goes from there. Um, you know, he did a little bit with stick sparring. And my experience was you did... Uh, fixed sparring, which is like um, like the six count drill we we're talking about. Right. It's a fixed pattern, and from there you go to a semi fixed pattern, um, which you kind of go back and forth, and you don't know exactly what's going to come at you, but it's only one of a set number of things usually. And then you have okay. some sparring, which you could just be anything you just have at it, you know. So you kind of build. You start with your basic disarms, your basic angles of attack, some sinawali, and you start to build from there. So what I remember, the first drills that I learned with him was uh, what he called the flow drill. Yeah. And with basic okay. angles one through five. And pretty much what, you know, what a lot of schools do. You, you, uh, it was kind of a largo, largo mono at first. You would just, uh, angle one would come, you'd slice. You know, angle two would come, you'd go slice, and you'd go back and forth. And then it got to a point where you didn't know which angle was going to come. But mm -hmm. he kept it within angle one through five. Yeah. And that was one of your beginning drills. Um, then there was, uh, um, well, we call it the box pattern. He just did six count, which was just the upper level. That's, that was the second drill. Um, and then, as he said, um, that drill could become, the, the, the stick could be coming from any, any angle, but you just didn't know what, but still within that area. Um, okay. He did the, uh, you meant the tappy tappy, which is, um, oh, you can describe it better. <laughs> um, well, that's a whole discussion into itself. Originally, tappy tappy was just a basic counter counter drill that you learned. Later on, it became much more than that, where you learned to bait in your opponent and tie up both hands, and it became, you know, it really grew from there. Um, but really, the, the big thing is, Professor talked about a lot of different things in your training, but to me, the two huge core things was flow and counter the counter. And if you didn't have good flow, it's not good modern underneath. You know, so there's trapping, there's all the other things we do, there's disarming, but really, those are the two pillar stones, I think, that he taught was how to have good flow and counter the counter. So, with, with regards to the flow, do you mean like um, regards to what drill you're doing that you're able just to flow pending their response, whatever it may be, and what have you? Right. It's not really force on force. There's always a little bit of a curve to a lot of things you're doing with the Arnese, which is why okay. it's a good bridge between a lot of hard style and even soft style because it had that little bit of redirection to it. Um, it had a lot of flow to it, and everything should flow naturally from move to move. And so, 
And that point, would he have you try within whether it was a six six count that Phil referenced, try to incorporate the locking in there, pending what you're doing? Yeah, you start with the and then maybe add a you know, like while you're on the fly in the beginning, you know, they swing and kind of stand there and you take the stick. Yeah, no, I understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes on now, we start to do a moving dynamic drill and I have to take the stick out in time, you know, with timing. Um, okay. Incorporate everything you've ever learned, you know, locking, disarming, and then put the stick down and do an empty hand as well. Okay, so, so which is one of my other questions was his empty hand component. Mm -hmm. um, was it, you know, basically it's, resemblance to boxing and all that or was it you know they had the, does he have the destructions and what have you and yeah there was some a, yeah what he would say a lot of times is you know, let's make the connection and make the translation and it took me a while to figure out what he was talking about and i finally realized it meant you know you should be able to take the take basic principle and do it with a stick or a knife or empty hand and still basically make the same thing work so we, okay. we would translate between those okay and um some kicks in there as well? Yes, he didn't do a lot with kicks, but they were in there. I know some okay. people wouldn't really teach them, but when you watch him demonstrate, you'd sneak in the kicks. Um, I know as time went on, I think he had some issues with his legs. Like I think they, his legs hurt sometimes, so I think he wasn't really big on the kicking. I'm but, kicking? Yeah. Definitely showed it sometimes and definitely is part of the art for sure. Yeah, I remember seeing him uh, at Lee School do these low kicks to the ankle Always low. Um, and yeah. step on the foot kind yes. of thing. Step on the foot, yeah, 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 yeah. Off and then kick the ankle, step on the foot, do that, you know. Yeah. Which, you know, when you're, when you're doing some of those drills, you're stepping on your feet, and you're like, yeah, this. Yeah. But, um, but I saw him do a lot of that type of thing. So his kicks were low. Um, yeah. And it's stuff you see in other, you know, kicking you see in other Filipino systems, very low to the ground. Um, right, right. Yeah. And um, I think as well, he would do sweeping techniques too. Oh, uh, sweeps. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Just on, I want to touch base just on forms. Um, uh, just to let you guys know, we got a pretty decent audience. Jalendo, thank you. Nathan, thank you for joining. Michael, thank you. Um, so yeah, so some nice comments and all that. So you're you must you're obviously well liked, <laughs> which is a good thing. <laughs> Phil, and we got Phil who's been holding back on us all these years. Yeah, <laughs> All right, just working on the forms, just, um, and this is, this is going to be new to me. And um, so, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, just like, what does that entail? Like, were there prearranged movements or, and, or was there flexibility to give to the students where they could create on their own? Or was it some that you had to do within the syllabus, per se, and then maybe creativity later? My experience was that there were eight empty hand forms and four stick forms, uh, the second form having a variation to it as well. Um, so what we do is we'd learn the base way to do the forms, but once you have the base way down, you can then experiment and start to kind of work with it a little bit and show your application to it. And that's some of my favorite training is the black belts who go off in a corner, say, hey, what's your application? So there might be somebody from Oregon, somebody from New York, and somebody from Florida. Oh, um, you guys cross-reference. But, but all showing different application behind the meaning for the move. So you might have the same move and three different applications behind the move. Um, so there was a basic template to it, you know, but you had something professors would say all the time is you must make it your own. And what that meant to me is tailoring it. Like in American Kempo, they'd say you tailor the technique to yourself. So mm -hmm. to me, that meant take now the basic template and tailor it to you. Um, yeah. It could be a slippery slope. You, know, you, you don't want to change it so much where it's no longer modern or niche but you want to keep the same basic template, but kind of. Make yeah. It yeah. Like you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to necessarily compromise the integrity of what the system, but yet you also want to be creative because it is you and your journey. So you want to kind of give it, you know, your sort of self-expression without compromising, you know, the intent or, or the, you know, how it came about its originality. Um, as far as the forms go, so right from the get-go, like a new student, do they start to learn the forms? In my experience, um, in, in recent years, I find a lot of people either don't know the forms or they just kind of don't practice them anymore. But back in the day, my experience was that you do start to learn them early on, and that was part of your training curriculum. 
uh, part of each camp would be set aside for doing your forms. There was some time allotted for forms, yeah. Course, yeah. Phil, what was your experience? Because you sounds like you were early '80s, so. Yeah, well, the stick forms weren't long. They're not, so it's not like you know you're doing uh, like a, a Chinese boxing form or anything like that. Stick forms are fairly short. Um, they they focus on body shifting, um, swinging the stick, that type of thing. Um, the empty hand forms, and again, I, I think I only remember one out of five that I had learned. Um, the one thing I like to do about the empty hand forms is when I started going to seminars, I would come back with the techniques from the seminar and put them into the form, into the. Okay. So you know, if uh, it was if it was um, black check and trap in the form, and I learned how to gun, you know, gunt and then and go for the eyes, I could do that and add it into the to the modern artist form. And then if I want to just do the, the basic modern artist form, I can do that also. So, you know, uh, as Frank was saying, you can take something and put it into the forms. The important thing, though, is that whenever you learn a form, a form is just an exercise, the way I see it. Some people kind of go off and they say, well, forms are a waste of time. You can't use them. You can... the point, that's not the point of them. Forms are there as, a, as an encyclopedia. They're an exercise for you. I mean, when you're, you know, when you start getting older, you're not going to be doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that much. I don't think. Some guys do. They're in their 70s. They're doing it. God bless them. Um, uh, or MMA takedowns. or Yeah. <laughs> but, not this but, guy. Yeah. You, you have to learn to apply the form. You have to take yeah. that form, break it apart. And I mean break it apart from uh, the first fist technique uh, it, all the way to make it bigger to a throw. You can add a throw in between moves. You can add a lot in between the moves. But... Um, Forms to me are important, and you, you, I think I, I don't think a system is a structured system is a structured system unless it, it has them to a point. And I know some people are like, well, that's you know that that mm -hmm. judo doesn't have them, and, and I get that. But um, I I personally like them, but I I make sure that when I learn them, I take them apart and and do and do the application. And if I can't find an application, then it's just an exercise. You know, it's a there you go. yeah. I mean, basically what you're saying, you can find a benefit out of it. If you can find a benefit out of it, then it has a use. It's positive. You know, for me, it's also a way to pass down knowledge from a teacher to a student. I have many students who've moved on and moved to other states or other places, but what they still have is that forms that I've taught them and they memorize, they can now practice those forms and start to figure it out themselves what the moves really mean. Right there away. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is I noticed I brought a professor for about a dozen seminars over the years. I promoted them. And um, I noticed every time that I brought him in, he spent some one-on-one -on -one time with me. He always wanted to see my forms. So I thought, you know what? Th there must be some reason for that. It's got to be significant. Right? Always wanted some time to making sure my forms were right. Yeah. So it must be important. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. That's um, because, um, um, you know, the, the, the what's so great about these things is they go by so quickly because, you know, all that. And they always kind of seem to take a life on their own. Like I always have an agenda of questions, but I always leave a lead way because of things coming up that will kind of go in a different, but a good direction, you know, a good change, but we'll also kind of self promote more questions or different questions right. and all that. So what I want to get to uh, now next is uh, before, because I definitely want to leave time to get, you know, cause you just mentioned you made DVDs and all that. So I, I definitely want to, before we leave to get you time to explain all that and where people get a hold of you and all that. Um, but far as, um, do you, like, how do you, and, cause I know like the school you currently have now do is a, is a Kempo based. Is that correct? I have three different curriculums. I have my Kempo. I have, okay. my, I have weapons. Um, I consider Kempo my base art. I think it's really okay. self-defense. You know, it's just such a wide variety of self-defense techniques, you know, from behind you, from the side of you, from the front of you. Sure, it's sure. Yeah. Really well-developed self-defense art. Um, modern East, I consider my specialty. I learned that right from the Grandmaster. Um, that's where yeah. I've known the best, and that's where I get invited in to teach seminars on. And then weapons I do because I love them. I just enjoy weapon training. <laughs> so when you say the other weapon training, like it could be staff, something along the – like, for instance? Well, okay. Uh, comma. Um, all the different weapons, uh, broadsword form, Boken. Okay. Yeah. What this, which kind of leads to my next question. How, what was, what were some of the benefits, you know, and it, and it could be anything. It could be on your school, your personal life, uh, 
you know, whatever that you that you definitely have received from your training in modern needs that you that you've seen it involve other areas of your life. Again, doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, the you know the martial arts and all that. Is there, can you share with us some of the things that the benefits that you received from that? Um, well, the first thing is it's a good collage of things that are important to me. There's physical training, and I've always been very athletic, and I love physical training. Um, I've also liked the competition of it. Back in the day when I used to compete sometimes, I loved the thrill of competition. Um, the other thing is just the amazing people I've met over the years. I've met so many just amazing yeah, people. Yeah. And I know, huh? professor, you know, a lot of people focus on his skill level. They want to charge his skill level. But I feel like that's only part of the equation. He's just an amazing person. Like yeah. anybody that... Anybody that got to know him, spent time with him, they all have a story, his stories about him. He was just an amazing person, and that's where sometimes we fall short. We're focused on this technical part of it, but he's just an amazing person. So mm. training has helped me to grow as an entire person, you know, from the people I met, from my training and the lessons learned. Yeah, you know, I've always, I've always known about him, read about him a few times, seen him and all that, but, you know, I just, um, you know, just – Never really got to find out, you know, much about Marnice and all that, you know, just like a general idea. So this is why I was kind of looking forward to, especially in having, you know, both of you on here. That that was going to be neat too, having two people at once. So, you know. <laughs> it's really, it's really funny. So, guy too. Like back when I first got married, he came up and he said, "Oh, you're married." I said, "Yes." He goes, "Oh, that's really good. You will be very happy. That's very good. You got married." And I was walking away. I was still within earshot. He went to my student who wasn't married, and, and he goes, oh, are you married? And he goes, no. He goes, you are smart. Don't get married. <laughs> <laughs> and I just had a very charming, funny way about him, and I still laugh. Oh, jeez. He laughed to this day. Yeah, here you are. Like I said, you're an earshot away, and he's giving some <laughs> you know, one of your students complete opposite of voice. <laughs> <It was fun. laughs> All right, so you mentioned DVD. So – are these have if you basically made these just for your students or are they are they or do you sell them or are they it's a kind of public yeah so many uh, have been made for every level and two different angles we show and slow and fast and one day I had an uncle visiting me from out of state and he saw the dvds he goes you should put these online i said nobody be interested in these and he said you should do it so i put them online and, and they started selling people really like them oh good for you oh and good he says people are in areas where maybe they don't have an earnings teacher uh i sold them in brazil i sold them in romania um, oh wow you know around the world really and um and people are buying them. and what's very cool is they'll tape themselves doing the material i show and they'll use sure. it back to me and i'll watch them doing my material like in rio de janeiro oh, that's cool and um oh that's oh, okay okay so I have them for my kempo my modern onis and a few for the weapons oh that's awesome so then um so what what is your current rank in my onis now um well back in the day when i took professor i was third black and i was invited to to do fourth but at the time the testing was out of state and i wasn't able to get to it so yeah. so i was third but what I'm very proud of is he named me as one of the senior students because I learned all material he was teaching. So he said, I consider you like one of my senior students. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, you know, I mean, Phil, again, from several people, I've heard nothing but wonderful things about you. So, um, wow. so obviously whatever you're doing, you're doing it right. So, you know, well, my check but, that? <laughs> but if we have time, I'd like to ask Phil how martial arts impacted his life. Like, how do you feel it gets made you better? Oh, let's do it. Yeah, we got time. Let's do it. <laughs> um, you know what? Martial arts were, you know, I, I studied, I started first, in, you know, I was 12 years old, and it was a place called the Hartford Judo Club on New Britain Avenue in Hartford. And I, I studied, I went there for about a year. And then I went to Tracy's uh, Kenpo Karate, which was in uh, Weathersfield. And then I saw this modern artist book, bought it found out that there was a seminar and again that that was a springboard to the Filipino martial arts and that's what you know it, it just I, I I stuck with it ever since and it's uh it's my go-to if I'm in a in a bad way or if I'm in a good way or whatever but it's something to go and practice and clear your mind and so I've stuck with it for as long as you have for many many years and continue and, and want to continue to do it yeah no no that's fine. yeah I know it's uh, well like everybody says lifelong journey right you know, yeah. you know, I mean, you, you know, you get out of it what you put into it and, you know, all that. Before we go, because we're coming up on an hour and I definitely want to get, okay, so far as, um, 
Frank, what, what can um, if people like again if they had an interest, they want to you know follow up with you or you know find out where you are and all that? What can first? Well, first let's, let's start with social media. Do you have a YouTube channel? Um, well, I have videos out there on YouTube. Just look up uh, Google Cromwell Martial Arts. I'm sorry. Okay, what was the name of the school? Um, Cromwell Martial Arts or my name. Okay. It'll come up okay, there. Cromwell Martial Arts. Okay. Or my name. Um, also, have a website, CromwellMartialArts.com. And people can actually, CromwellMartialArts.com. can actually order the videos right off my website. All right, CromwellMartialArts.com. Yeah, there's a, you can pay through PayPal or send a check in and actually order the uh, videos. Okay, because I'm going to, uh, when I get off here, I'm going to list these in the comment section so people can. And, uh, and um, all right, so we got Cromwell Martial Arts as far as the name of the school, website, CromwellMartialArts.com. Um, it, uh, this uh, Facebook is that ba basically as far as social media, the best way to get a hold of you? Besides, yeah. obviously, a phone number. Yep. So I have I have a Crown Martial Arts web page on Facebook, and also one on my name. Or if they want to call me, you know, it's eight six zero. Okay, eight six zero nine three zero nine three zero eight four seven one to text or call. Eight four seven one. Okay. And then also you got on Facebook here, you also have a page and that's under Cromwell. Cromwell Martial Arts. Is also oh, your name. Okay. 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 And, uh, all right. Oh, fantastic. I do um, I'm definitely going to list all this for you when right. I have to, like, when I can put it here. The other thing is too, is before, generally speaking, this, this one I shouldn't have to. Sometimes I'll edit. I have to edit on this one. I think we're going to be good to go. So what I do is when I get done here, I take the file, I transfer it to YouTube, and then bring it back on here. So, um, and usually I'm able to, I'll be able to do that tonight. So what happened is when I get when I get that done, I'll put the link to YouTube, and then I'll tag you, of course, and Phil, and you guys can, you know, share it and what you want because this will stay up. But usually, what I do is after I get the the final one done, I'll usually. X this one out, or if there's a lot of good comments, sometimes I'll leave it. You know what I mean? Depending on how it goes, but I wish there are. So I, I may just leave this one. Jalendo, thank you. Jalendo actually um, put all your information down. Oh, wow. So, yeah, that was very nice of him. Jalendo, thank, thank you. Yeah, it'll save me. <laughs> but Phil, I want to thank you so much for actually, it was Phil that brought your name up. And uh, so, you know, Phil, thank you for this because Phil. I got to be honest. This is one of the more educational ones for me, to be honest, because a few of the ones I've done, one was Piquita Terja, uh, one was um, Yuli Romo system, which has a lot of illustrations. Uh, one was my my old partner. So I kind of had like some some background and you know and all that. But this one here was was actually thus far the most educational. Good. So I enjoyed it. You know, thank you for you know, yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. I, I really enjoyed it, and um, and we're gonna list that stuff. Any now, as far as regarding Master Priestess, any closing comments you'd like the folks to hear? Um, no, just that you know, he's the great art. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Priestess was an amazing person. I recommend everybody try to do a little bit of look up on him and, and research him. He has YouTube's out there. There's videos. You know, there's yeah. some, there's some books. You know, so you know, add it to your art, you know, whatever art you're already doing. Could you, if you don't mind, so the folks can see, can you hold those books up? Just sure, here's one. Okay. And then here's another one. Okay. And this one here is basically that one, but this is the, uh, the, the first printing. Oh, the original. Oh, okay. Wow. That's a, uh, that's a keeper, huh? Yeah. yeah. Falling yeah. apart. So one day I got yeah. home and it was this big box at the post office waiting for me. And uh, I went to the post office and the professor sent me like about a hundred of these books. <laughs> it was the craziest thing, you know, and I've sold them all, you know, and they're a great book. Oh, wow. I'm going to have to look. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. But, um, all right. Well, this has been wonderful. I want, I thank you both for taking the time to, you know, to chat, you know, I great. truly enjoyed it. And based on the comments, they were nothing but positive and, uh, Wonderful. Yeah. So, thank you. You know, thank you again, guys. You're right, welcome. Dave, thanks. All right. Keep in touch. See you soon. Yes, absolutely. All right, Phil. Thank you again, guys.
See you later. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Okay, that wraps up episode 10. Um, that was a good one. Next week, Mike Williams uh, of Massachusetts. Uh, we'll be talking to him and his wife. Um, trains has trained uh, C Lot uh, with uh, Uncle Bill William the Thors, and also currently trains with Nene Tortal, Pete Detergent. So that should be a good one. So stay tuned. Also, don't forget, please hit like and subscribe. Okay, trying to grow this and grow our community. Thank you so much, and until next week.